<laughs> um, if you would, turn to Proverbs, the first chapter, and we'll reread this yeah, relatively quickly. So for those of you who haven't been here, we've been studying in, in Proverbs, the very first chapter. And the whole point behind this is it sets up basically the rules whereby we should live our lives. Okay, Not all of them, but it, it heads us in the right direction. And it makes us aware. So, let's begin. And this is Proverbs chapter 1. It says uh, This is verse 1 in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to re receive instruction in wise behavior, Righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, that last statement, a fool. Gee whiz. What are we told by Jesus about calling someone a fool? That's kind of a dangerous statement if we're not real careful with what we're saying here, right? Um, in this, I'd like to read one other Run another proverb right quick. It's in the eighth chapter. And it's verse 13. And as it reads, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate everybody and everything you see. Just be a grumpy old person. Well, actually, Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Let's so read that one more time and read it carefully and think about what's being stated. He says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. How many times this week did you see a commercial on TV or an advertisement on TV for something that's abhorrent? It just, they just appear out of nowhere. You just about can't hit the channel changer fast enough. You just are constantly being barraged with this sort of thing. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Well, I point to these commercials as that. Because what do we hear all the time? We've been barraged with it since we were little kids. And you think it's going to stop tonight just because someone said so? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way. Well, what is the evil way? I'll leave that to your imagination for the moment because I, I didn't intend to get to explaining on this, on this particular verse. But I wanted us to be aware of this business about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate the evil way. Do you actually hate that? Or how many times in a given day, or a week, or a month, or a year, or just any time in the past, or the past, have you given in to the evil way? I have. You've got to readily admit it to yourself that, hey, there's just times that I'm on the opposite side of what God's told me how to behave. And this final part of it, pride and arrogance in the evil way in the perverted mouth. I hate the perverted mouth. Gee whiz. I'm not going to try to get into the definition of what I think a perverted mouth is, but we could study that. But just roll it around in your mind. How many times can you watch a movie these days without hearing something that's perverse? There's words that are used almost casually that have almost lost their meaning from whenever I was a kid that just seem to be present in everybody's vernacular now. Why is that? 
Our senses get dulled over time as to what is evil. So it's not just one person's definition of evil. I think we're in here because we understand that our Creator is given, given evil has been allowed to happen for a particular reason. And again, I think it's a test. Can you or can you not pass the test? Can Kelly Roberts pass the test? Well, sometimes. Well, wait a minute. Is sometimes good enough? You gotta roll that around in your own mind. So, with all of this, you know, I've been stuck on this thing about a riddle. Yeah, BC. What is a lie? It's a perversion of truth, isn't it? You can just boil this thing, you can boil all these things back down to their essence if you want to. But do you have that desire to do that? Do you have that desire to be pleasing to your Creator? So, oh, excuse me, didn't mean to gouge myself in the eye there. Um, I've been studying on something which I think is, for lack of a better term, maybe this comes from what I do for a living, but, uh, uh, or try to make a living. Uh, I consider this a heavy duty subject. And it goes back to what we're talking about here in Proverbs, in particular 813, and the very first one of these things. Um, it's the word truth. If we think about this, do you consider truth some form of a riddle? Who made a famous, what's one of the most famous statements that were made in the New Testament? Made by a guy that was in charge of a lot. I'll give you the first two words in the statement. What is truth? Have you ever tried to just sit down and roll this around in your mind? Who defines truth? What's the purpose of truth? What if we didn't have truth and it was okay to tell everybody a lie? Oh, I'll be over there at 8.30. You show up at 9 o'clock. Or you show up at 7.30. Well, I mean, I just that's a real simple uh, oversimplification of things. But what is truth? And when that question was asked, what was the purpose of that? The question had already been answered, hadn't it? But how many of us in here know that answer? Well, that's kind of the intent here to point back to Proverbs. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. Now, I'm not trying to be, act like I'm some smart guy up here, but where do we find instruction in truth, in the ways of truth? Here, right? We don't find it from Gandhi or any of these other writers through the years that have been around a long time. I'll read some of the stuff from Socrates from time to time. A little bit of Benjamin Franklin. Some of the newer writers, I'll read some of this stuff. But where is that standard of truth? It's right here, isn't it? And if one will do a self-examination of what truth is, it stands the test, doesn't it? Absolutely. So if you would, I'll come back to the definition of truth after we've read a little bit here. So if you would, let's go to the Gospels and turn to Matthew 27.
Okay, in particular, we want to pick up at verse 19, and we want to read through 26. But let me ask you this right quick, and keep this thought in mind. Who wrote Matthew? Matthew, okay. But was Matthew here when what we're going to read about? Was he there? Was he a personal eyewitness to this? So now we put ourselves to the test when someone says, oh, well, that's just a bunch of hearsay that was written. Was it? So, Matthew 27, let's pick up in verse 19. I think we all know what's going on here. Verse 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, this was a reference to Pilate, the man that asked the question, what is truth? While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. In our terms these days, kill him. Murdering. Verse 23, And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. Stop there for just a second. What do we see these days on these shouting matches that we see on television between politicians and whatnot? Who's trying to outshout the other guy and shut them down and make them be quiet? Especially by making them ashamed of something they said. Has anything changed very much from this point in time back then? There's an old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. What do we see in human behavior? Even after we've been taught by the master teacher. Verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Boy, what were they asking for? What were they asking for? And how many of them were absolutely convinced that they were correct about what they were doing? We go back to Proverbs, a misunderstanding of what was going on in Proverbs. So let's turn to Mark. Mark 15. Who do we think wrote Mark? Well, maybe a fellow named Mark, but probably Peter did most of the repeating or, or the writing in this. Maybe not the writing. But that's who we, you know, in studying this, that's who we think was there, or did this. So Mark 15, let's read verses 1 through 5. Early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders and the scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate, answered, um, Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. The chief priest began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Wow. Wow. What's your natural inclination 
What's your natural in inclination if someone comes up and charges you with something that uh, may or may not be right? What, what, do you, what do you do? You bow down or you run away or do you try to defend yourself? Well, how is Jesus defending himself here? Where is his defense? What's going on here? Well, think about this for just a moment. These people are charging him for a charge where he's said, I am the Christ. Which meant what? He's God. Okay? Wait a minute. That can't be right. He's a human being, isn't he? So his, his answer right here, according to Mark, is, well, the way Pilate says this, you do not answer? Or do you not answer? Well, what's Jesus actually referring to by his, his silence? Think back to what I've already spoken. That will speak volumes to you. Who chose to ignore what he said? Or who chose to just go, I don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to use the logic that's been taught to me since I was a kid. Because after all, who are, these, who are these people that are there? It says right here, in the morning the chief priests and the elders and scribes. And who probably had some of the best, best understanding of this? Scribes. Either that or they're just automatons writing out words, not paying any attention, but I don't think that's the way scribes work. So let's go a little bit further. Let's go to Matthew. No, I'm sorry, Luke. Luke 22. And again, I pose that question. Was Peter there to watch all of this? Well, now, what about Luke? Where was Luke at this point in time? Luke didn't come along till fair, fair ways after this. But apparently, how do you think Luke got his information? It was probably told to him after it had been retold how many times? How many times do we retell the same story and it comes out exactly the same every time? It's tough for me to say the same story twice and using exactly the same words, unless I were reading from a book. Okay? Now, I'm not saying anything that is not accurate. Don't misunderstand me here, okay? Because I think there's full accuracy in what's being talk talked about here. So, in Luke 22, let's look at verses 66 and 71. It's a long chapter, right? 66. When it was day, the council of the elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God? Or are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Nah. What does your Bible read like? It's a flat out, Yes, I am. How can you misunderstand that? What would cause you to misunderstand that? Preconceived prejudices? And I'm not talking about prejudice of color or skin or anything like that. These are Jews not believing a Jew. Maybe I'm wrong in the way I'm going to say this, but Jesus was the Jew of Jews. And here he sat before basically a bunch of politicians 
That's what it boiled down to, except maybe the scribes. But if you get into studying, and this is where I urge you to do this, <clears throat> you'll learn about Ananias or Annas and, and Caiaphas and their relationship to each other and where a lot of this was taking place at this moment in time. So, but he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, are you the Son of God? And he said to them, yes, I am. And they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. How convinced do you think they are about what's, being, what's, what's going on here? I have no doubt in my mind that some of them were absolutely, totally convinced. But some of them knew what they were doing. Because what had Jesus been teaching all these years? Changing the hearts and minds of people with what? Absolute truths. And what did we have here with this council? Had what they've been doing through the years been absolute truths? Or there been kind of a little bit of shaving off going here and a little over there to their benefit? And that continues today. We see it in witness on the news all, every, all, all the time. Once in power, they don't like to be out of power. Those sort of things. Again, Scripture is showing this right here. And I urge you to study about those two characters I just mentioned. Okay? Chapter 23. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. For those of you that know Scripture, you know it was otherwise. They're forbidding to pay taxes and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Hmm. Think about what he said here. It is as you say. Well, what did he just say? He said, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 4, Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. He expressed the obvious, didn't he? Verse 5. But they kept on insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. Where are they at right now? What's the name of the city they're in? the town. Jerusalem. Okay? When Pilate heard it, this verse 6, when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. Well, who is Herod? Anybody remember who Herod is? Huh? Yes. King of who? Verse 8, now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. He wants to see some magician tricks, huh? Verse 9, and he questioned him, this being Herod, and he questioned him at, the same, at, at some length, but he answered him, nothing. Why do you think he didn't answer? Why should I repeat to you the evidence that I've already given? The evidence stands on its own. Bring in the people that saw it and ask them. He 
He answered and said nothing. Or he answered him, but he answered him. Let me back up verse 9. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there. These are the witnesses, right? Well, where's the witness that told Luke about all this stuff? Let's go a little further here. And he questioned him at some length, and he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. Vehemently. We've all seen movies with the guy sitting inside of this enclosed room and the police are asking questions and pretty soon things get pretty heated. Do you think that might not be the same? Because we get that word vehemently put in here. That's a descriptive, isn't it? They weren't just going, well, Jesus, you know, you want to have a donut and some coffee and we'll talk about this. Or was it more like the other way around? We know we've got the evidence on you. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him of vehemently. And Herod and his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate, catch this next part. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with, another, with one another that very day. For before they had been enemies with each other. Is that not politics at work? And I'm not talking about modern day politics, all that stuff, but politics today are just like they were back then. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I got your back, right? So, let's turn to John now. John 18. And if there's one piece of the New Testament that you will read and concentrate your efforts on, this is one that I highly recommend. I, I can't recommend it enough. We're going to skip down a little bit. We're going to pick up in verse 19. And let's do this right here. Who were the two that followed Jesus when he was arrested? One of them chopped off the ear of one of the servants. Okay, and Jesus put the ear back on and fixed it for him. That should have been a miracle right there for the people standing there. They should have been totally amazed. At, hey, how did he do that? But who were the two? Who was bearing the sword? Peter. Peter? Who was the other one? John. That's what everybody figures it was John. So out of anybody, John followed him Maybe standing in the background. Because if you study about John, you'll come to find out something about John and his relationship between Annas and Caiaphas. Okay? And this is where I think this is a first-hand account. This is not something... Because John wrote this, didn't he? So this part of this is a first-hand account. So this one, I think, stands the test... He want to put this above the others. And I'm not saying one's not equal to the other, but here. So 18, verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching, and, and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? So he turns it back to these guys. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Gee whiz. What kind of answer did the priest give here? I mean, did, the, did this officer do? He struck the guy for just stating something that was the truth. Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Why are you using force here? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, 
the high priest. It's like we have two high priests going on here, all of this stuff. So in verse 25, so Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Well, wait a minute. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I wanted to skip this part because I'm trying to chop the time down here as, as soon as I can, as, as much as I can. So for, let's pick up in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the, into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. What was one of the things about eating a Passover for every Jew? They had to be filthy, dirty, nasty. What's the opposite of that? They had to be clean. And that means we can't go into a Gentile's house. We can't even go in there where Pilate is. Because to do that is committing sin and will be dirty. So. Therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, would we not have delivered him to you? How truthful is that? Verse 31. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Hmm. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. Verse 32. To fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. I want to cover that right at this moment. Verse 33, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, and this section is really important to remember. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. What's he telling us in saying that? We have to live in this world, don't we? Some people choose not to live in it. They just do something that God said don't do. But we have to live in this. Do we make the most of it? Or do we just kind of skirt around the edges? Eh, I don't want to do that, but I'll do this instead. What did Jesus choose to do? He chose to do as he was instructed, didn't he? What did he ask in the garden before he came here? Just before he was arrested? Let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will. What happens every time we sin? We put whose will against whose will. Do I really need to answer that for you? Verse 37, Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. I'll ask again, is truth a riddle? I suggest to you that it's not, but you have to study it to figure this out. To testify to the truth, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? He didn't hear a word, did he? What is truth? He heard it, but he did, he, did it do any good? What is truth? How many people in this world do we have now that say, what is truth? Well, truth is what Bill over there says, or you know, John over there says that. What is truth? Gee whiz, you can turn on TV 
and watch till your eyes bleed out onto the ground and you'll have so many versions of the truth you don't know which way is up, do you? So we have here a man in Pilate and I suggest to you that you learn a lot about Pilate. Does anybody in here know when he was relieved of his command, so to speak, in Jerusalem? What year? 35. These are things that are in the history books. That they come directly from Roman history. Okay? And it's a, it's a pretty neat study to read about Pilate and some of the ways that he thought. At the end of the day, it is confirmed. I believe Tom and Bonnie have been there before. Or was it in Ephesus? They found a gate that had crumbled, and on that gate was inscribed the name Pilate that was on there. So for people that say, well, he was just this is another non-existent thing. No, no, we, there are concrete proofs on this stuff. So with that, the bell is rung, or the buzzer has buzzed, and uh, I need to answer a question. Does anybody remember last week's riddle? Or a week before last? Or was it last week? I can't remember. Gee whiz. The riddle was this. I never was, am always to be. Everyone's looking, but no one sees. No one sees me. What am I? Well, let's cut this short, because I've got another riddle. The answer is tomorrow. You think about it. Does tomorrow ever get here? <laughs> So, here's the new riddle, and you guys, I think you'll find this entertaining. A doctor and a bus driver are both in love with the same woman, an attractive girl named Sarah. But the bus driver had, had to go on a long trip. It would last a week. Before he left, he gave Sarah seven apples. Why? I try not to cheat and look it up. I'll repeat it one more time. A doctor and a bus driver are both in love with the same woman, an attractive girl named Sarah. The bus driver had to go on a long trip that would last a week. Before he left, he gave Sarah seven apples. Why? Who wrote an apple a day? Ben Franklin. All right and I do try to eat an apple a day. <laughs> I don't know if it does me much good or not. But again, see, what happens with these riddles and these things here, it causes, and the whole point behind repeating these things, it causes you to stop and think. Think into these things. What is Scripture teaching us? It's not here for entertainment. It's here for our salvation. It's for us to be found pleasing to our Creator when our time comes. Any questions? Anything I've said that's wrong, please let me know. Thank you. Do you have another riddle? Next week. <laughs>